us again today. And our scripture, we will read. You find it in the bulletin. He said it's actually John 16, 4 and 6 and 12. So if you'll turn there, John 16, starting with 4. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. In verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you that ye cannot bear them now. It's good to come and meet with the Decatur Church once more. I, I hasn't been so very long ago I was here. And I think, Brother Di, uh, I don't know what your schedule is, but is there another appointment? I think you told me another one in July, if I remember right. But if it changes, you let me know, because it seems like that... Uh, Moving in with my family, we always have family challenges. In fact, my wife was concerned that we have uh, <clears throat> kind of interrupted family plans a bit today because we have a daughter and her, ch her uh, my granddaughter visiting, and we were supposed to be with them for dinner today. So when I finish, I'll have to run and go to dinner with my with my daughter and her, uh, my granddaughter. <coughs> we enjoyed a good fellowship dinner with you before, and I guess I better meet this appointment with the kids who've driven what, uh, from Kansas City area to be here. I want to just introduce our thoughts this morning. When I gave this sermon title, my thoughts were that it seems that reaching people today with the things that we would like to share with them, it seems it's getting more difficult. Don't you think so? How many people do you have on your little study and witnessing list right now? Would we all say, if any, not enough? Don't you feel that there is sort of a time when we need to be really pondering how are we going to do what we know to be the mission of the church? I've mentioned often, as I have spoken in recent years, that one of the big issues in the role of witnessing is getting around to doing it God's way. Now, Brother Di and I have probably sat in hundreds of workers' meetings, various meetings, and I don't know about Brother Di, but I, I sometimes hear a lot of very humanized uh, proposals in what we ought to be doing human ideas than to be back down here in Arkansas again where it's sort of a country area. Um, it's, we just have to use that old country expression, it ain't getting done. And so this morning as we study a little bit on the thought of when our testimonies are possible. Let us let me pray just a moment that we can have our thoughts open, our attention focused on where God is leading us to make this message a final message. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can realize that we are approaching closing times. 
And I thank you that you are here, very able to accomplish what looks so impossible to us. And as we study these few moments to understand the role given to us and to understand those to whom this message must go, I pray that the Holy Spirit will fill us with kind of the kind of love to reach out to them and that you will fulfill those promises that you will bring all things to our remembrance that you've commanded and taught us in the time of need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As you might note this morning, I, I'm only uh, just a months now, I'll be 20 years older than David and Solomon ever knew. And I'm like, I'm like uh, Paul in a certain sense. What was that uh, infirmity that Paul was talking about? I think it came up in some of our Sabbath school helps today. How many know what his infirmity was? His eyesight. And I've got a I've got a Bible, they call it, it's not a large print Bible, it's called a, a giant print Bible, and I'm, I've gotten to the stage where I, that's just what I need in my reading. I see pretty clearly in my out vision, I can recognize every one of your faces as I look about, but for some reason I have a macular degeneration that I can be looking at a word and I have to look a little bit to the left side of that word to read it all because there's a hole in my vision that will blot out two or three letters as I try to read and in some of my reading and a brother that has the mic this morning I've decided I want to use you where are you there he is there he is Brother Neil, you're going to be my mic reader today, okay? I don't need the mic, but I want I want to give you something. And when I call for this, you read it for me. Is okay, it's, it's ready to go. <laughs> okay, all right. Sometimes when we look at the opportunities to reach out and to be witnessing to others, there's this, this pondering, what can I say and how can I get them interested? You know, Jesus made the comment, you know, in, uh, in his time, he looked out to the, the Israelite people and they were, like, uh, they were like sheep scattered having no shepherd. It seems that down at the temple about the only interest that was held there was how to induce people to put a little more money out of their earnings into the operations of the priests and temple. But we recognize Jesus looked out and saw these others, and he said, the harvest is ripe. These people are hungry. They're, they're, it's a, Israel was looking for a Messiah, weren't they? Have you ever known a generation that was doing the same? Is there a generation that's looking for the coming of Jesus? And we, I believe there are honest hearts outside of, from among us that, that are. And I certainly trust that everyone sitting here in this audience today is comprised of those who are longing to see Jesus come. And as we do this, we realize there are things that, Christ is waiting for before he comes. And I think the last time I was here, I spoke, a, it was a sermon kind of surrounded by Acts 3, 19 to 21, where it talks about Christ whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things. And our Sabbath school lesson this morning, dealing with purification, the Lord's waiting for that, isn't he? in the minds and hearts and lives of his people. But 
we're looking at a world that needs a message. And we're looking at a world like Brother Saubel read therein, in John. He said he had many things to tell them, but they weren't able to bear it. And I want to spend just a few minutes looking at doing something that will enable people to bear what we have to say. You know, as Seventh-day Adventists, each one of us has a mission. Each one of us has a little place where we're an influence. We've got family. We've got neighbors. We've got people who are starving for help, and perhaps they don't know that we have the help for them. I was, I'm interested in, a, in a, a special kinds of ministry in my older years. The Lord has shown to us some ways in which we can accomplish what needs to be done. The gospel is not an impossible mission because Christ said, how much power is given us? All power. All that's needed has been given us. In fact, I last week I spoke at, at the Sulphur Springs and show, to show a little insight on how God has led from the very beginning. And when sin came in, God had to, had to have a way to reach people and Satan had op had open field now to work because Eve had invited him in, so to speak. And Satan has been so busy that there have been times in history when, when God looked down and he said, well, men's hearts are only evil continually. Do you remember hearing about that race? What happened to them? They didn't believe it could happen. There had never even been a shower of rain, and yet Noah was trying to tell them that there's a flood coming and God is going to destroy this earth. It happened. There was a prophet to enlighten people to know that it happened. And all through the ages as crises came, we think of the days of Ahab when, when Jezebel had gotten the world to following the pagan ways. I've got a little book I want to leave with you today as you go. It's called Baptized Paganism. It was written by the son of the late Joe Cruz, one of our, of our evangelists in years before most of you knew about, I guess, because Joe has been gone several years now. But this little, the, the issue in the days of Ahab was that God's people were doing terrible things. They had adopted the, the rites and the organ, uh, orders of worship that were practiced by the pagans into their system. And uh, we read in, in the, the prophets of old that they were even burning their babies to satisfy these angry gods. And that was a crisis, wasn't it? And so Elijah was the man called at that time to meet with, Ahab, meet with Ahab and to meet with the 850 false prophets who were carrying on these, these terrible rites, not only in the, their heathen altars where they were burning little children. And I've understood in some of the records that one of their favorite things to burn was a teenage girl. And so we find that in the times of terribly troubling issues, God provided a prophet. We could come down to the times of John the Baptist. Israel needed help, and God provided John the prophet. Jesus said there had never been a greater one than John. Why was John the greatest? That Messiah they looked for was his message. Well, here we are today. Do we have a prophet? Shall we look for another one?
that question. Ellen White was asked that question. You know, uh, are we to look for another prophet to come before the end of time? I've always, I've always registered and anchored my satisfaction with her answer. She said, God's people have received all the light they need to prepare for the coming of Jesus. And I recommend, as I did in my last sermon here, I recommend that we pay close attention to what God has given us in the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Ellen White. The answers to the needs that are out there in this world today are there. I want to open your Bible this morning to Matthew 13 for a moment. I'm going to skip skip down to verse 15. And if I wish someone was here with the Bible, but I'm going to attempt to read it, and I'll read a little to the left to try and find it. It says, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and should hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Doesn't that describe the world today? How many people do you meet on the street that have an interest in what God wants to do for this world today? You know, uh, we've heard it many times when we talk about the coming of Christ, the Seventh-day Adventists. We'll hear that old answer, well, you know, nobody knows. Nobody knows when. Could be a thousand years. Have you heard that before? <laughs> it's been said many times. But here we find a world so caught up in things and issues that it's hard to find those who are seeking and searching and wanting to hear. Our world is involved in, in so many of Satan's traps that it would, it would take a long list to define just what it is that's troubling this world today. You know, just about two weeks ago we had a, 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 a shooting and uh, it, it got all the news and then the same day, a truck overturned up here in north east of Kansas City and what well, killed 50 people. And then on that, I believe that was the day that the uh, the truck was stopped with a load of Mexican illegal immigrants, and there were 56 on board. 40 of them died. This world is so full of tragedy. That's that's all we hear in the news. Practically, trouble, trouble, trouble somewhere, and people perplexed about what to do. Was it just yesterday that the Japanese former prime minister got shot? It's in the news. Difficulties. And how? What about a month ago, when the Supreme Court overturned the Roe versus Wade issue, which has been a, a, a very ungodly decree? What's happening? What's the response? We're not over that one yet. I think next fall when the senatorial election comes on, we're going to hear a lot about that. And I think then uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, uprisings because I see that states are dividing up pros and cons, aren't they? Politically, Nothing is unified. But there's someone who thinks they have the answer. And he's been visiting around to many nations and speaking as to what the difficulties are that are bringing so many of these calamities on the earth. And he has gone to these nations and he has said to some of them, the trouble is people are desecrating Sunday and not worshiping God. 
Do you know who the person is? Brother Dye knows. He's, he's read the report. We have a Roman Catholic president who vows to be a staunch believer in, in, in Catholicism and in, in the Catholic style of Christianity. But in his everyday conversation, conversation he can, what, what is the old term, cuss like a sailor? He can use the most obnoxious, vulgar language in his speech. And he can exercise the deepest frowns and the most hate toward anything that disagrees with his points of view. I'm not into politics. I want to urge all of you, if you've, if you've registered to vote, nullify it. Unless there's an issue that comes up regarding the Sunday law, then let's, let's have our ears and our eyes open to, to be able to do what needs to be done. But brothers and sisters, we're in the last days. And I believe that if we are to give a testimony that has possibilities, we have to start making a connection in which we are familiar with our audience. How do you get someone interested in your kind of life? When I moved to Bedford, Iowa, back in 1987, it was back at that time that uh, David Koresh and the mess down in Waco, Texas was, was being, uh, trying, they were trying to settle it. The outcome wasn't very good. But I moved there and I, uh, I bought a little farm to build a house on because I believe in country living. And as we as we were getting started pouring the slab to build our home on and so forth, some of the neighbors had gotten a strong, strong rumor going that Adventist preacher is setting up a compound out here. And it got into the school. We had one of our Adventist members who was a teacher, and it was going all through the school that the Adventists are building a compound out west of Bedford. When I bought the farm, I had bid against someone I didn't know. And anyway, later, I became acquainted with a man. He was the next door neighbor. He wanted that little farm pretty badly. I, this was back when 1987, Iowa was in a depression. Land was cheap. He was already in debt. All he could handle, he just couldn't add any more debt to his circumstances to buy it. But this man and, and his daughter were the ones who started the rumor. And you know, I just I, I, I just didn't know how quite to relate to my next door neighbor. One night, I was driving home from prayer meeting. We, it, it was just a little late in the winter and it was dark. There was five or six inches of snow on the ground. And as I turned up the road to go to my house, his, his place was just on the right and there I saw a tractor out there nearly 10 o'clock at night, just swirling all around in the barnyard. And as I looked and the lights shone, I saw that there was a cow that had just given birth to her calf in the snow. And he was out there struggling to get that calf up out of the snow. Well, I drove up to the house and quickly took off my suit and got on some grungies and a heavy coat and I drove down and I saw what the problem was that the cow was cross. She wasn't going to let anybody near the cow. And he had a cage in his tractor. He'd back up to it to pick it up and, 
And as soon as he'd get out of that, off the tractor to go to the cage and get the calf, the cow would, would quickly put him back on the tractor. So I drove in and I, I said, Keith, I said, they're having trouble with that. I said, well, let me get in the cage and we'll go down and I'll pull the calf in and you stay on the tractor. So I got in the cage and he backed down where they were and I got a hold of the calf and drug it in. And the cow followed very willingly. We got up into the barn and turned them out. We became good friends where there was a little resentment before. I wonder, dear friends, if we realize the need for what Jesus was talking about. There in John 14, he said, you're not able to bear it. I wonder if some of our work is understanding what we must do that people will be able to bear it. We don't do well standing and arguing with people about the state of the dead. We don't do well arguing with them about anything when they have been deceived to believe something different. We must be acting in a way that we can break down their prejudices. The county auditor in our county there a very nice lady. Uh, she got a cancer, and Wanda and I spent several visits to their home, visiting and praying for her. She was a Presbyterian. She and her husband were leaders in their church. And as we visited, we we dealt mainly with her health problem, of course, and just wanted to let her know we were praying for her. Her husband was working on a on a project trying to put a an entry slab into a, a, a tool shed. And he was having trouble knowing how to form up to the doors. Well, uh, I was on a visit there and somehow it was sort of known that I I was a preacher who was kind of a carpenter and a builder, too. I guess Neil knows that I built several buildings for the church. But I, uh, he asked me about how to get this form made, and I went out and did it. And uh, I even helped him pour the cement when the truck came. Well, the next time I visited, I was out there talking to the husband and, her, and Carol, the county auditor, the lady came out and she said, oh, wait a minute, I don't, I, I got a hit on my story. I gave Carol a little book. I want to show it to you. It's a little book I wanted her to read. written by the son of Joe Cruz. Not very big. You can read it an hour, maybe an hour and a half. She read it. And when she came out where I was helping Vic there in the, some of his tool shop issues, she came out and she said, Dwayne, I read that book. And she said, I've always wondered why we have our church services on Sunday rather than on Sabbath. I'll have a little more to say about this. Sometimes we think it's going to be difficult to reach out to people. We pray for the latter rain, don't we? What are we expecting when we pray for? You know, if we pray without acting, our prayers may not get much higher than the roof of this room. If God's people are not cooperating with the instruction God has given them, 
Will God go ahead and do the work without us? Probably not include us, will he? So I will, I'm going to ask Brother Neil here to read for me from Testimonies, Volume 7, a little section on page 140, and I have it marked for you, Neil. Please. You want me to read where you have it uh, marked there? It says, uh, and in a large degree. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I have it bracketed for you. Okay. In a large degree, through our publishing houses, is to be accomplished the work of the other angel who comes down from heaven with great power and who lightens the earth with his glory. Solemn is the responsibility to rest upon our houses of publication. Those who conduct these institutions, those who edit the, the, PR, the uh, periodicals and prepare the books, standing as they do in the light of God's purpose and called to give warning to the world, are held by God accountable for the souls of their fellow man. To them... Keep reading. To them, as well as to the ministers of the gospel, applies the message given to God by the prophet of old. Son of man, I have called thee a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore shall thou hear the words at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Ezekiel 33, 7 and 8. What about that? In a large degree, the work to be done by that other angel that comes down with power and great glory. What do we call that? Revelation 18. The latter what? The loud cry, the latter rain. Like I mentioned, Brother Neil and I have seen and heard many, many, quote, ideas. And it, it, even among preachers, it can sound foolish. Bottom line is we're still here, brother. <laughs> Let's try God's way. If we want to know how to be prepared to reach out and have an influence on people, we are to take in these out and someone quote the rest of the passage for me. Scatter them like leaves in the autumn. Brothers and sisters, I don't, didn't know whether you knew it or not, but our little church in Sulphur Springs just covered your area with literature. Did you know that? We sent out the little book. I'm going to I'm going to give you the background of the book. It was about last a year ago, last March. I called Elder Mark Finley. Well, the reason I called him, I had talked to a friend of mine, Dan Houghton, who who works for Heart uh, Foundation. But he directed me to Elder Finley, and I talked to Elder Finley about preparing literature that the churches can truly afford to be getting into and scattering like leaves in the autumn. Dan told me that he and Mark had been discussing it. Well, Mark got busy. And he wrote a book. And I think it was finished about June or July. And uh, I think all of your people in this community have already received it. The title of the book, The Three Angels' Messages. that sound familiar? Does it sound appropriate? We are seeing so many things going on I don't know how radical terror 
in the streets and death and the great traffic ways that Ellen White talked about, I don't know how much more serious these need to become before we need to say it's time to do what needs to be done. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that there are, there are personal times that we can get involved with, with uh, uh, with people that will be an influence to open their minds. Their their eyes are closed. Their ears are closed. They're dull of hearing and not even wanting to hear. In Luke chapter chapter. Is verse 52, there's an interesting thing that is said about Jesus. What did Jesus do the first 30 years of his life? You got any idea? My, my ears are, are a little dull, but. Uh, carpenter. Huh? Carpenter. He was a carpenter in, his, in, his, in Joseph's carpenter shop, yes. But it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says that Jesus increased in stature and in what? Favor with God and man. I delivered a calf, or picked up a calf out of the snow. Jesus went about doing good, doing something that he could that would benefit someone that we could help or benefit. I believe that we're not going to do good to earn our way to heaven. We do these things because we have what I talked about the last time I was here. We have let God change our hearts to where we have a love for sinners and want to do something for them. And so if we're going to be effective as message bearers, let's make sure that we start using God's plans. And I believe, as we've read it here, that the largest part is being neglected. We need to start scattering like the leaves of autumn. We need to make sure that these truths get out into the hands of people who need them. These little books are testimonies. <clears throat> I want to tell you about one promise that I know about those little books. I don't know how many angels there are in heaven. They're innumerable. But I do know that if we scatter literature like the leaves of autumn, that God can he keep a certain promise that I've read about. Do you know who's going to be attending those little books? Angels. I want them to. I want to have them out there so that the angels come and can come and do their work. Don't you? May God bless us, brothers and sisters. Every one of us can afford it. I have bought thousands of books. Uh, the one that I gave to Brother Staubel and some of you to pass out last week, Power for a Finished Work. Did all of you get it? Do you know, that, or are there any who did not get that book that you know about? I have more of those that I would like to share. I have another little book I would like to recommend to church members. Are there any of you that give Bible study? have someone that you're sitting down with and opening the Bible and, and kind of contemplating the teachings. Uh, this was the one that, this is not the one that I prefer, but I gave away the last one that I like. There was a little book written, Helps the Bible Study, written by J.L. Schuler way back in the 19, uh, about 1960, I believe. It's Elder Schuler doesn't mince words in getting to his point when he wrote that book. And I think it's one of the nicest ones if you have Bible study to sit down and then give your... They'll cost a little money, probably $3. But give to people 
written studies of what you present. They, if, if the Holy Spirit can arouse attention in their minds, they can open that book and turn back to see. I opened right to it just then, what happens at death. They can look and see and rediscover for themselves. And you know what? Someone has said, people don't argue back with what they read. And sometimes we can get into discussions in which it, it's almost an argument. I, uh, I was at a minister's meeting in Minnesota, and I'm going to quit on this one. So we need to be going to my point. <laughs> but this... We were in a, in a uh, it was a weekday, and we were in a shop buying, looking at suits. It was a Jewish uh, clothing store. And this one minister, uh, if I'd mentioned his name, you would know him, Neil. This one minister, a little bit brave, and he said to this Jewish operator, he, he said, do you keep the Shabbat? And the Jewish looked at him as a puzzle. What, are you crazy or something? And this minister reared back and laughed. And he said, well, I'm a better Jew than you are. I keep the Sabbath. Now, what do you think that did for that Jew? He, don't you think he said, I wish you were out of here? That's not the appropriate way. <clears throat> there will be times in which we deal with people, let's deal with them kindly. Let's deal with them in a Christ-like way. Let's deal with them knowing, as Brother Stobble read, there are many things I'd like to tell you but you're not able to bear them now. Be a kind, considerate, Christ-like Christian. What's the greatest need on earth? Kind, loving Christian. May God bless you to be one this morning.